Hello everyone and welcome to your Glass Nerd Video Report for Week 13, 2024. So today we're looking at the phenomena which is very, very typical and characteristic of bull markets, which is taking profits. And one of the really powerful components about on-chain analysis is we can actually see these events happening. And not only can we see the profit taking occurring, we can also break it down to find out by who. And this is where we bring in the component of cohorts, our long and our short-term holders, and really link a whole series of things together, especially things we've covered over recent weeks. Now you may have noticed over the last couple of sessions, we've really focused on this all-time high breakout. And whilst we've obviously been above the previous cycle all-time high for a period of time now, um, at the moment we're currently trading in pretty much just above $70,000 at the time of recording. But through this process of breaking through previous all-time high, we've actually seen the reactivation of old supply. Long-term hold of supply is being spent, and this is a very classic phenomenon that we see in every single previous all-time high break. Now, we're going to look at this from a few different angles. Over recent videos, we've more or less touched on the unrealized profit or loss. Think about this like the cost basis levels, MVRV, AVIV ratios. These are all models that are describing the unspent supply. So think about this another way. All of the coins that are not moving are holding some degree of unrealized profit or loss. Those indicators, MVRV and ABIV ratio, they are all describing how much unrealized profit or loss is in there. And the right way to think about that from an on-chain perspective is that this is the incentive to sell. And it's why when it gets to certain levels, there's key levels for short-term holder MVRV and there's certain standard deviation levels, various things that we'll use to track when do investors hit that point of statistically meaningful or behaviorally significant, when do they start to say, well, I'm up enough or I'm down enough, I'm going to either take chips off the table or that's it, I'm done, I'm capitulating during bear markets. Now, there is a second component to this. We're going to spend more time focusing on that today which is the realized component. So the system metric of MVRV is SOPA, one of the more, prof um, uh, more popular metrics, sorry, um, within the world of on-chain data. And we're gonna really do this transition from unrealized across into the realized space. So we have the incentive for them to take profits, which we covered last week, and I would strongly recommend everybody check out last week's video before really carrying on with this one, because it will give you a really good backstory for how we got here. We will touch on some of the core components in the uh, in the first part of this video, but this is all about the transition across into the realized component, which is, yes, they're in profit. Did they take those profits? Because that's ultimately what creates the actual sell side itself. So as always, please do give us a rate, a share, and a subscribe. It does help this channel get to more people. And without further ado, let's get stuck straight into the analysis. Okay, so just starting off with a bit of mind map about where we actually are in the cycle. Here we're looking at price performance since the all-time high. We've touched on this in recent videos, but I think it's a nice place just to reorient ourselves. And where we're tracking is the since the all-time high from April 2021. And again, I've gone over the logic of this in previous videos. Really, we saw that was the sentiment all-time high. Despite the fact we hit an all-time high by price in November and even October, there really wasn't the same gusto behind it. We had very weak on-chain activity transaction counts, transaction volumes, active addresses, lots of things that would indicate the chain wasn't quite as alive as it could have been, as well as some very significant bearish divergences, multi-month divergences on MVRVs and various other metrics that really describe there was a lot of sell side. A lot of people were sold at the top. There was a lot of top buyers and it really just described this oversaturation and not much gusto. Now, the important takeaway from all of this is that bear market sentiment kicked in in April 2021, and therefore we measure things in terms of duration. In the blue curve here, we have last cycle. And strangely enough, we are almost in the exact same location, both by duration and by performance relative to the all-time high, to where we were in December 2020. So back then in December 2020, we were actually attacking the previous cycle all-time high, attempting to get above it, um, right before that, uh, the, the actual full-scale bull market, the euphoric phase of the bull, let's call it, we are technically in that euphoric phase of the bull, and we'll see a couple of charts that will really describe this through this session. But just to really orient ourselves, things are strangely, remarkably very similar. Bitcoin has these cyclical patterns, and whilst there's no question, at some point in the future, many of these will break down, Thus far, a lot of them seem to be holding up remarkably well. So uh, this is just one of those strange features of Bitcoin 
It's working until it doesn't. Now, this is the, last, the only chart we're going to touch on that kind of alludes to last week, just to help remind you and set the scene. Last week, we looked at MVRV and we looked at AVIV ratio. Again, these are the unrealized profit or loss multiple. Now, the key takeaway from that phase, we have a plus one standard deviation line up here in the darker green, and we actually tagged that level. Now, this is where we hit to on that um, the all-time high in November. And by the way, note the massive bearish divergence. This is what I was talking about before. How can you have a higher price, but a lower unrealized profit or loss? Because there are more investors with a much, much higher cost basis because there are top buyers. We've seen the distribution pressure that actually creates the bear. Long-term holders had spent so many of their coins that these new buyers had high cost bases, 50, 60, almost $70,000 cost bases, and it was much, much higher than it was in April. That is telling you that we've had a distribution event and the top is most likely going to be in. This is a big bearish divergence, one to keep in mind. Well, who knows when the, uh, the top of this cycle actually comes put in, but one to certainly keep in mind in the tool belt. So nevertheless, the takeaway here is that again, we're just using very simple statistics. There will be more refined models depending on who is looking at it, who is doing the analysis. But for the case, we've got a level of plus one standard deviation where generally speaking, we see the market character start to shift. We move into a more euphoric phase, a lot more volatility and a lot more profit taking. People are now in a meaningful amount of unrealized profit and some people will take those chips off the table. Now, speaking of chips off the table, here we're looking at the total supply in profit. So literally how many coins, and this is a binary categorization, if the price is one cent above its cost basis, it's deemed in profit. If it's below, it's deemed in loss. So it's a very binary setup. How many coins are in or out of profit? Now, of course, we're just doing this visually, and I can talk about the numbers here, but the, those who are running this uh, this type of metric through um, you know some kind of calculation or uh, or API and actually doing this into any kind of trading strategy, what I'm going to describe here is a way to identify periods of well let, let's call it cost basis concentration, supply clusters, however you want to frame it. When we're at the all-time high, naturally every coin is in profit. When we get a sell-off, however, and we can look at this in terms of how much the price falls, how many of those coins go from a binary in profit to in loss condition? Now, over recent weeks, we've pulled back from about 73,000, the all-time high, and we got down as low as about 61,000. Now, in that process, approximately 2 million Bitcoin dropped from in profit to in loss. Now, because we're at all-time high, that's technically telling us that there's 2 million Bitcoin with a cost basis above 61,000. So we're starting a bit of refine the actual cost basis calculations. If we then have our, our rally back up towards 70,000, there's about 1 million coins. So we, we kind of retraced about 50% of the supply in profit. Now that's telling us that we've essentially got about 1 million. Uh, I forget the exact numbers. I think it's 66,500. So don't quote me on it. It is in the written report. Um, but somewhere between 61 and 66,000, there's a million Bitcoin with the cost basis there. And then between that 66,000 and 73,000, there's another million. So we know there's about 2 million coins as of the time of writing that have a cost basis within our current correction zone. And it's split roughly 50-50 at about 66,500 is the price level. It's kind of in the middle of those two. Now, of course, what we're seeing here is a much, much deeper correction in our total supply in profit. So speaking about that MVRV and why I brought up this bearish divergence, we have seen a lot more coins get distributed from a lower cost basis, could be from the FTX lows, it could even be from the 2018 or even earlier cycles, it doesn't really matter. We've had a lot more coins transferred during recent months because of all the new inflowing liquidity from these ETFs and the excitement and all of these components, there's a lot more coins that have transacted up here. And as a result, when we get these pullbacks, yes, it's only a 15 odd percent correction. We've had many 15% corrections since the FTX lows, but this is the deepest correction we've had in terms of total supply and profit because there has been more distribution pressure. We have broken up through the previous all time high and this is typically when long-term holders start to distribute. Now, of course, there's a series of questions I've had in the previous video in the comments section asking about GBTC. So my take on GBTC, and we've done previous studies, it's something on the order of about 50 to 60% of the current long-term holder spending is GBTC. Now, 
this is actually perfectly normal. And in many, in, by my account, it is behaving exactly the same way that long-term holder sell side should. Because there's always going to be nuances. In previous cycles, GBTC was actually growing up. So yes, it was just long-term supply selling to GBTC. Well, this cycle, we have GBTC as the long-term supply and it's selling to, well, some of it's just straight up sell pressure by many of these bankrupt estates. But some of it is sell pressure moving into other ETFs, but some of it was also sell pressure moving into GBTC. So these nuances always, always exist. The important thing is, did he still sell side pressure that must be absorbed by something? Is it another ETF? Is it a hodler? Who is it? Doesn't really matter. There has to be a demand come in to soak up that GBTC supply. So yes, we can argue that it's, it's GBTC and long-term holder, and there's a crossover, but it is functionally acting in the exact same way that, that long-term supply decreasing always does. So, you know, there's nuances and there's error bars, but generally speaking, at least to my eye, and having spent enough time with this data, in many ways, a lot of these nuances often collapse down to just nuances that sometimes matter, but a lot of the time actually don't matter that much. And certainly when we're looking at just things from an objective kind of big picture view, the more you drill down, the more refined we look at it, yes, these things make more of a difference. But in, in terms of what we're looking at here, those coins must still be absorbed by somebody, an ETF or otherwise. So now we're gonna transition. That was a lot of setting the scene, right? So what we've done, we've looked at unrealized profit, the incentive to sell has reached reasonably high levels. We would then say, okay, we're expecting sell side pressure to pick up. Where it's coming from, some of it's hodlers, some of it's GBTC, doesn't really matter. They are coins that are being distributed in some way, shape or form. And they are doing it at the exact same time that we always see it start to pick up, which is breaking the previous cycle all time high. As I said, Bitcoin has this strange clockwork, which just seems to play out time and time again. So as we transition across to the realized framework, we're looking here at a series of SOPA metrics. Now SOPA is essentially, if every coin in the supply was spent today, SOPA would equal MVRV because all the unrealized profit is locked in on that very day. Now, of course, not every coin is spent every day, SOPA is looking at the subset of MVRV, think about it like that, the subset of MVRV that was actually spent. So it's the average profit or loss of the coins that did actually get spent. And MVRV will then describe all the coins that remain within that supply. Now, naturally, we can then break that down by cohort. And we've got the entity adjusted here in orange, which is going to really clean up a lot of the uh, internal wallets and self consolidations and exchanges and all that stuff. We've got long and short term holders, we've got adjusted variants. Here we're looking at a whole different series of, of, of um, SOPA variants. The big takeaway is all of them are ripping to the highest level they've been certainly during this cycle. And if we look at it in terms of entity adjusted, we're actually getting up to the height in January and February of the 2021 bull market. So we are hitting very, very high levels. The average coin that is moving, let me just grab this level, is on the order of 1.35, which is telling us that a 35% on average profit. Now, a lot of this is driven by long-term holders, of course. They're gonna be realizing a lot larger. Generally speaking, as with many averages, there's gonna be, the, 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 be fewer transactions with very high profit and a lot more that have a lot smaller, right? This is kind of the dynamic of any population distribution. Many of these metrics function the same, and that's why we can also look at short-term and long-term and all the different components. The takeaway here, profits are being taken and it appears to be accelerating. As the liquidity comes in with the ETFs, with the additional news coverage, all these components that happen when Bitcoin breaks the all-time high, traders of all shapes and sizes and ETFs and whatever are taking the opportunity to take chips off the table. We are seeing the average profit ticking higher and we can actually see that many of these metrics peak and reach a certain zenith at the actual price peak. Because remember that profit taking is essentially a, it's a meaningful component of what establishes local and global tops because sell side pressure is quite literally what oversaturates demand. Now I'm gonna break down, this is just looking at the, the realized profit itself in terms of USD. So SOPA is looking at the average profit or loss multiple locked in, right, in terms of a percent. What we're looking at here is just the dollar value. So how much actual capital had to flow into Bitcoin to absorb those coins? Another way to think about it, let's just imagine for simplicity, somebody bought their coins at the FTX lows at 15,000. They're now selling them here at 70,000. 
the delta between however many coins they bought multiplied by 70,000 minus 15,000, that's the price change, that is the realized profit on that coin. Now we've broken it down by short-term holders in red, long-term holders in blue, and you can see much the same as SOPA, the dollar value of how much profit is being locked in right now um, peaked over $2.6 billion per day, per day. This is very, very meaningful sums, um, but at the same time, Bitcoin is much larger than it was during previous cycles in terms of market cap, it continues to grow. There's more coins in circulation and obviously the ETFs are fairly substantial. So we see this kind of market cap, but also in inflow of demand growth each cycle. This is literally part of the growth story of Bitcoin over time. But nevertheless, these are fairly substantial numbers. And of course, realized profit is also telling us about the demand because for every sell side, there is somebody coming in on the demand side. Every seller has a buyer and every buyer has a seller. So this matching of realized profit and realized loss and all these different components is telling us something about the amount of capital flowing into Bitcoin, whilst also telling us that there's a series of people who are divesting. And those coins must obviously be absorbed. Otherwise we will get corrections, we will get local peaks, we will go into consolidations, these are all components that functionally create price action because nothing goes up or down in a straight line. And it is this sell side pressure, which we're measuring, observing, slicing and dicing, that tells us about what the market is actually doing. So again, these can be brought into all sorts of different models. Some people will look at it from a statistical framework. Some people will look at just absolute levels. Whatever works to actually understand and break down the market, the important thing to take away is that realized profit we can break it down by long and short term holders and see whether it's traders, people who recently acquired, people have held their coins for a long time. What's the magnitude of that sell side? How does it compare to previous cycles? How does it, you know, all these different elements come into the mix. Now, speaking of the long term holders, if we look at it, this is the dominance. So the way to think about this, and we're actually just going to focus in, if you can kind of get your eyes in tune, we're just going to look at the dark colors here. Blues across the board is long-term holders. Red is short-term holders. The darker colors or these richer colors here, maybe not darker is the right term, but the ones that aren't shaded out, these um, more bright, let's call them, blue and red is profit, realized profit. The other ones in the darker, you know, softer hues here are realized losses by these different cohorts. And it's literally looking at all the money that's moving around the system of all the realized profit and all the realized loss, how much of it is long-term holder? How much of it is short-term holder? How much of it is in profit? How much of it is in loss? Now, what we can see is that as we come up towards the previous, here's that December all-time high we talked about before. Long-term holders and short-term holders kind of meet in the middle and actually their dominance fluctuates and move around. Previously, short-term holders really dominate bear markets because it's kind of the speculators. Long-term holders are typically buying and just putting those coins away. There's periods of capitulation and you know, in the deepest phase of the bear, it's kind of in the middle in terms of losses. But generally speaking, bear markets are short-term holder territory because they're the ones that are actually chopping and trading and turning coins around. Everyone else is essentially the holder. They buy once, they take it off exchanges. That's the end of their day. Now, as we move into bull markets, and particularly as we break the previous all-time high, long-term holder profit comes up and becomes a very meaningful part and it sustains that pretty much until we get to the actual cycle peak. You can see here that we actually have long-term holders then start to decay off. Once we get to the cycle peak, long-term holders start to decay off. So at the moment, we're in a period of long-term holder growth in terms of their dominance. They are becoming an increasingly important part of the sell side pressure. This is actually a big part of why we use cohorts because we can now establish and say, well, long-term holders are a much more important part of the sell side pressure than they usually are. And this happens as we break previous all-time highs. In every previous cycle, this is what is going on. There's the long-term holders that have been pretty much dormant, sitting on coins that the market has discounted. They've been stuck in cold storage for a long, for a long time. They're now coming back out into circulation and the market must now absorb those and they must find a new home. And there's also a lot more speculators. So those coins are gonna be more liquid. And this is actually what creates the larger and larger dynamics. There's more coins floating around, there's more coin activity. And as a result, you need more demand. And this is literally describing market cycles. This is not just Bitcoin, this happens on every asset. We just happen to be able to get deeper resolution and see it in the on-chain space. Now, the last chart that I wanna close on, which is actually one of my favorites, these ones are just fantastic. 
what we're looking at here is the overall, I mean, there's, there's a lot happening. So let's just kind of break down. In terms of the colors, we are looking at how old the queens are. In terms of the darkness or the richness of these zones, it's those supply clusters. How many coins are actually located, have a cost basis in that zone. Now, notice, here's the all-time high break back down here in the 2016-17 border. Notice that we go from, it's a bit hard to see, but the red kind of explodes only during the break all-time high upwards, the euphoria phase of the bull. Note, 2019, we never had one of those big, rich explosions of very, very young coins. Remember, a coin can only become young when it used to not be young. It used to be a long-term holder coin, one year, two years six months at least, coins that have been held for a lot longer than 24 hours. As we break the 2020 all-time high, suddenly there's an explosion in these young coins. This is distribution pressure by the long-term holders. They are going from old to young. And notice that the supply cost bases cluster all the way. These are the top buyers. We are looking at a huge cluster of people buying high who ultimately end up selling much, much lower, and we get these capitulations, right? And then you get these big supply clusters that get accumulated down near the lows. So uh, like clockwork, as we broke the all-time high, long-term holder distribution picks back up again. And again, this is why I come back to all of these cyclical patterns. It is remarkable, and I do find it remarkable how consistent these patterns seem to play. Now, I would recommend people actually check this out in the report. Um, because we go in a bit more detail just to explore some of these different clusters. But really, we can see there's a very, very large amount of coins that were acquired back here in 2023. There was a lot of supply that changed hands and continues to be held to this day. And he's starting to get into the, you know, moving into the one year type territory. Um, so a lot of these coins have, have been acquired down there and held ever since. We can also see some of these supply clusters on the way up are starting to get built up. Right, it's looking a little bit like the 2019 phase where you've got these initial bursts of activity and it creates that excitement and people start to step back into the market. But very, very distinctly, we've seen a character shift on the all time high break where we now have new supply coming online. Supply that has been dormant for a long time, back into circulation, finding a new buyer. This is very typical of this euphoria phase of the bull. And it, you know, it, as thus far, it looks very much the same as previous breaks. So uh, a very consistent story um, and really kind of describing this initiation of the long-term holders as a major point of sell-side pressure. As analysts, if you've been watching this channel for a long time, we kind of touch on the long-term holders here and there. You're now starting to see that I'm covering them a lot more because they're becoming a very meaningful part of the market mechanics. Um, and they will typically be so. Their distribution pressure will continue to ramp up if history is a guide all the way through until the market actually peaks out. And then we can start looking for those inflection points as well when things actually start to cool down, which is sometimes telling us that the market may have run its course. So thanks for tuning in for that session, folks. Hopefully you found that one useful. Again, it's really amazing how we can see all these market mechanics. Um, I'm very, very positive we have block time data for every asset, whether it's gold, commodities, stocks, bonds. I believe you would see all of these patterns playing out across all these different assets. Of course, with their different nuances, but we just happen to be able to see it in great color and full 3D when we're looking at it through the lens of Bitcoin because we do have access to this data. Um, we can see them by cohorts. We can break it down by spent, by unspent, by in profit, by in loss, and by who? Long-term holders or short-term holders. And this framework of thinking about things in terms of spent, unspent, thinking about things in terms of in profit, in loss, what does that mean in terms of the incentives of the investor? And also looking in terms of, well, which type of investor people have held for a long time or people who haven't. And different components of that kind of three-way axes will make more sense at certain times. That right now, we're spending a lot more time looking at realized profit because realized loss is less important. Once we get to the all-time high and the actual cycle peak, and even during corrections, losses start to make a more important role because there's not many of them on the way up. But when lots of people buy the top and they start to panic, that's when you start getting realized losses accelerate. So we start looking at that, particularly from the short-term holders, because we know long-term holders have spent. These are just some of the mechanics that on-chain data is fantastic at looking for. Um, and you know we'll be exploring this uh, as it moves forward. So anyway, hopefully you found that useful. Hope you enjoyed this session and I'll catch you in the next one.
Cheers.